All right. Welcome, everyone, back to another virtual shadowing session at Hearts for Health. We hope finals went well all for you. Um, I know for those who are college students, it's the season for finals. Hopefully, y'all enjoy your winter break before the spring. Um, but we're happy to prevent the, present this session with Dr. Oxman. We're here to talk about po podiatric surgery, not a specialty that we've covered so far. Um, and I'm very excited to have this as our first one. Uh, so here we have our speaker, Dr. Oxman. She is a board certified fellowship trained foot, ankle, reconstructive and peripheral nerve podiatric surgeon in Chicago. Um, so she's actually attended the fellowship. She'll be talking more about herself later on. I do have a few reminders for our participants listening in, especially if you're new to virtual shadowing, if this is one of the first times you've um, tuned in for one of our sessions, this is something that would really apply to you. So in terms of how our sessions are laid out, we have our presentations, but at the very end of each of these sessions, we do have a Q&A. If you have any questions for any of our speakers, we have a variety of speakers and a variety of specialties, you're always free to type in that um, in the chat, which should be either to the right or the bottom of the video that you're watching right now. And I will read them out at the very end of our session once we wrap up with the presentation. Um, so that's going to be safe for the end, but you can type in your questions at any point in time. Another thing is we do have more shouting sessions um, and we have had past shouting sessions. So if you want to stay tuned with those, what you can do is either follow us on Instagram or uh, join our listserv. Our listserv is an email that we send out once a week, including flyers for sessions like these. That's probably how you heard about this session through our flyer. So that's something that we post on Instagram, but we also include that on our listserv. To join our listserv, you can either go onto our uh, website. We have a subscription form at any of the web pages at the very bottom on the left-hand side. Fill it out, click submit, and you'll be good to go. Or you can just email us at shadowing.h, the number four, h at gmail.com. And then you'll also be good to go. We'll manually add you on. Just be sure to include a personal email, a Gmail or Yahoo, and your name. Um, and we can add you on from there. If you have any questions, by the way, for us, feel free to shoot us an email through that address. I don't want to take up too much time. So Dr. Oxman, feel free to take it away. All right. Well, thank you so much for inviting me to speak on podiatric medicine and surgery. I'm very passionate passionate about my field. Um, to everyone that's listening, uh, it sounds like how could I forget that fine, it's like final season. Um, so thanks for taking the time to learn a little bit more about uh, podiatry. So like you said, my name is Dr. Stephanie Oxman. I am a um, podiatric surgeon located in Chicago, Illinois, and I own my own private practice, Oxman Foot and Ankle. So these are kind of what we're going to be going over today, just going over what is a podiatric surgeon. I remember uh, in college, like go, joining my pre-med club because I knew I was always going to, into the medical field, just didn't know what I was going to go into. And actually the first person that came to visit us was a podiatrist. And I was like, ah, this isn't it. And, you know, more than 10 years later, and here I am as a podiatrist. So excited to talk about it. Uh, we'll get into like what the path is like becoming a podiatric surgeon, the different specialties in podiatry. We'll kind of go a day in the life, try to shadow me, and then talk about a few cases, some common cases that I see. So um, you may have noticed the letters behind my name are DPM. So that is a doctor of podiatric medicine. So um, different than an MD or a DO, but we are a physicians. We are physicians and uh, everyone goes through at least a three-year surgical training um, and residency. And really we focus on treating the foot, ankle, but also other related structures of the lower limb. So in general, in general we look at different musculoskeletal conditions, uh, definitely traumatic injuries such as fractures, not just of the foot, but also ankle sprains, open wounds, circulatory conditions, skin conditions, definitely infections. And that kind of goes along with diabetes as well. Well, um, managing and helping manage metabolic disorders. And one of my favorite is neurological conditions. So while we are focusing on the foot and ankle, really, um, we still have to know everything about the body. And that's something that I really want to um, highlight because sometimes I even have patients that won't even fill out what their medications are. They're like, well, why do you need to know them? I'm like, well, <laughs> everything's connected and it is extremely important to know everything, um, going on with your patients. 
So where do podiatrists work? And hopefully after this conversation, you'll start noticing us more and more. Um, we are a small group, but we are becoming more prominent. Uh, a podiatrist can definitely be hired by a hospital. So some hospitals have a specific foot and ankle or podiatry group, or sometimes podiatrists are part of the Department of Orthopedics. Um, I have colleagues that work in academic institutions, and there they're doing a lot more research in foot and ankle, multi-specialty groups, private practice, solo practice, which is what I am currently, and then also direct care, which is also a movement in um, medicine these days where instead of insurance-based, you're uh, cash-based um, practice. So a lot of variety, and let me tell you, everybody has a different opinion on where the, what, what they like to, where they like to work and what they like to do. So for me, I knew I was supposed to be in a private practice. My husband, who is actually also a podiatrist, he would, does not want to work in a private practice and he works for a hospital institution. So, um, while we focus on one thing, we all have different subspecialties as well. So what is the path to becoming a podiatric surgeon? And this varies, um, in other countries, but we're going to, if anybody's listening uh, internationally, but this is going to be based off the um, U.S. schools. So I did a four-year undergrad. I uh, majored in biological sciences with a minor in psychology, and then I attended a four-year accredited podiatric medical school. And within the, fir the first two years of podiatry school, I shared majority of my classes with uh, the with the DO students. So all my tests, all my classes were exactly the same, same grading scale. Uh, and that was, I really enjoyed that one because I got to meet a lot of new colleagues, but also um, just being able to show that our curriculum uh, is based off also the DO curriculum as well. Then going on to a three or even a four-year surgical residency, most residencies are three three years, but there are a few out there that are four-year, and then you can also complete an additional year of fellowship training. And um, one thing when I, I always knew I wanted to go into the medical field, but I, I shadowed a lot of different uh, specialties, and then when I found podiatry, I knew it was my calling, and I was very nervous to go, um, thinking in my younger twenties that I'd be giving up my life. And I will say that I enjoyed my time at my, uh, podiatric medical school, Des Moines university. Um, it was the best years of my life. And I have so such close friends. I know not everybody may have that experience, but it was the best decision for me. And these are my people in the, the bottom right-hand corner that I'm still in friends with today. Speaking of podiatry schools, I kind of just mentioned that I went to Des Moines University in Des Moines, Iowa. There are nine schools with two, uh, now 10, and an 11th on the way. So there's um, Arizona uh, at Midwestern. Barry is located in Miami. We have two in California, Ohio, New York, um, Temple. We have one in Chicago. And then now in Texas, and then soon to be Lake Erie just got accredited. So it is a growing profession. Um, I interviewed at several, but I decided on Des Moines. I'm from St. Louis, Missouri, and had to stay in the Midwest. Felt like I needed to stay in the Midwest, um, but eventually went on to uh, interview and go to residency in Washington State. But... I kind of wanted to touch on the podiatric medical school curriculum. I took this off the Des Moines website because that's where I went so I can touch on it. And I want to, so the first year you're really in um, spending majority of the time in those foundation, what they call foundational sciences, right? Your biochemistry, cell bio, um, you're taking full gross anatomy. So my first day in gross anatomy, we were, we started on the head and neck. So I had to learn every inch of the body, not just the foot and ankle, clinical medicine, same, like we'd be learning a full uh, history and physical and applying a, a clinical practices, 
along with the DO students. And you can see how little of time we actually uh, had of podiatric medicine in our first year. The second year also spent with the DOs as well. Um, a lot of pharmacology and advanced uh, sciences, dermatology, cardiopulmonology, neuro, nephrology, nutrition, and GI. On the second half, that's when we started focusing a little more on the lower limb. So we took an additional anatomy course just strictly on the lower limb and foot and ankle and um, started slowly getting more into more focused during the third year into podiatry curriculum. And then our fourth year is actually a very interesting year because that's where we do our clinical rotations. Each school has a different um, breakdown of these clinical rotations, but I did eight outside rotations at different hospitals around the country. So every month I would move to a new hospital or new state and spend the month there and learn from, and it's usually associated with a residency program. I'd spend the month there um, learning and rotating with the residents and attending. So I went everywhere from Washington to Texas, Colorado, Kentucky, um, so, oh gosh, a lot, a lot of, uh, put a lot of miles on my car, but it is a excellent year where I feel like you learn just as much in that one year as you did the last three years. And you're really focusing on podiatric medicine and surgery. And then a few other rotations I spent, had to spend a month in with internal medicine and then also private practice. So after fourth year, went had to take several boards through um, school, had to go undergo a residency uh, interviews and a match process, which could be its own discussion. Um, but I did match to my uh, top choice of residency, which was in, located just south of Seattle, Washington. And I want to go through kind of what that training looks like. Um, this is my personal uh, training schedule. So every residency differs a little bit, but there are um, required rotations. So I'll go through those. So my first year as a resident, I spent a month on anesthesia with the under anesthesiology. So I was intubating patients. I was giving them medication. I was um, the right hand resident to the anesthesiologist spent two weeks with the radiologist, one month under general surgery. So I was also assisting the general surgeon and scrubbing in a month with internal medicine. So during that month, I was acting as an internal medicine first year resident where I had to round, come up with a plan um, and speak to the attending. So just like any other uh, internal medicine resident, a month with infectious disease, two weeks under pathology, two weeks with a PM&R, and then six months was with uh, my attendings doing reconstructive foot and ankle surgery and podiatric medicine, and then also a month of emergency services department. So within that month, I had overnight call. I was going to work up patients. Um, so that first year, you're really touching on a lot of, a lot of other specialties and getting a well-rounded education and training as well. Second year, um, a little less outside rotations, which I was happy about because every time I was on outside rotation, I was grateful that I knew I chose the right field for me. I was able to go to um, Georgia and do a mini fellowship with Bagel Pathology. So sp specifically spent two additional weeks after my pathology rotation, learning more about dermatological um, uh, diseases, spent a month with the orthopedic uh, department. So I was doing total hips, knees, shoulders, um, hand surgery, uh, still had a lot of time with podiatric medicine and reconstructive foot and ankle surgery, a month with vascular surgery, a month with wound care, and then also biomechanics. In your third year, that's your last surgical year. So you're doing a lot more of the reconstructive foot and ankle. Um, we also had a rotation with sports medicine and learning jurisprudence, but other common rotations uh, during other residencies, sometimes you spend uh, several months with plastic surgery or a burn unit, pediatric orthopedics and OB-GYN. So just showing you that while 
we do focus on the foot and ankle. That's like, you'll hear we're foot and ankle surgeons. We really do have a, um, a lot of time spent outside of just the foot and ankle. So we are a well-rounded and educated profession. And then if you're still feeling like you didn't have enough, you can spend an additional year or some people do additional two years with a fellowship and a fellowship. Um, I a fellowship is that additional training in your field that maybe you'd be able to help specialize or learn something additional that you didn't get in residency training. That's how, what I think of a f- fellowship. My fellowship was in complex deformity correction and limb salvage with a special emphasis in orthoplastics, meaning got a little more into plastic surgery and performing muscle flaps and um, peripheral nerve surgery. So injuries of the lower of the nerves of the lower limb. There are a lot of, this was the fellowship that I wanted. There are a lot of different fellowships out there. Some people just do strictly learning more like business management for private practice. Some people do sports medicine. Some people do a research wound care. So there is always um, something out there for everyone. What I liked about this was I was able to uh, enhance my training for maybe uh, what other people may not be able to focus on. I was able to travel internationally. The top uh, photo is me in Mexico. Um, they have a, was had the opportunity to spend time there um, with the, the orthopedic team. Um, they have many tra- a lot of trauma and was able to perform external fixations with just the device around the leg and a lot of different uh, orthoplastic techniques and muscle flaps. So Speaking of many different types of foot and ankle fellowships, that kind of leads us into the different specialties in podiatry, which is kind of funny to hear because you everyone thinks already that podiatry is specialized, like, right, we just focus on the foot and ankle, but you'd be surprised how many subspecialties and how many colleagues um, are able to tailor their practice into exactly what they want. So I have colleagues that just do limb deformity correction. Um, lengthening limbs, uh, helping prevent amputations, people that just focus strictly on sports medicine and elite athletes. Many, I have colleagues in Chicago here that work with um, professional teams. I have friends in strictly pediatrics who like love working with children and there are congenital foot and ankle deformities that they're able to um, treat. Others focus strictly on dermatology. So if your surgery is not your thing, that's okay. There are um, wound care, dermatology, at-risk foot care. So there are still like those more palliative or in-clinic procedures. So some people are like, Surge, I don't want to do surgery. Well, there's an avenue for you. Radiology, um, people strictly focus on reading MRIs and x-rays. Limb salvage is a term that we used to try to save a limb from amputation that goes hand in hand with wound care and diabetic at risk foot care, functional medicine, um, more of a holistic approach and looking at the whole body and different fascial planes and nutrition, um, the health of the foot and ankle and whole body. Some that just focus strictly on trauma and able to work in those level one, level two hospitals and do ankle fractures, pilon, which is when the whole ankle kind of is really broken or your heel bone breaks. Um, and then peripheral nerve injuries I had to add because that was my specialty, but even more, there's even subspecialties in forensic podiatry where you are part of a forensic team. And that just leads me because there are so many more that if you want to learn more about the different subspecialties, I do host a podcast called, called She's a DPM um, where I interview other uh, colleagues. So I have colleagues that are part of army that focus more on sports medicine as well. Um, sports medicine, just a lot of different insights, um, from podiatric surgeons around the the country. So I would recommend you listening as well after just if you're intrigued by this conversation today. And then we're going to go into kind of try to talk about a day in the life of a podiatric surgeon. So on an average day, 
Um, since I am involved with the residency program and work outside of the hospital, even though I'm in private practice, if there are inpatients, I'm usually doing that in the morning, rounding on the inpatient scene if anybody needs an add-on surgery. Um, your day may consist of surgery at uh, the hospital and or clinic, usually seeing uh, clinic patients every day. Um, one of the Worst parts of the day is the notes and dictations, right? Like paperwork, there's always something to do. So that's in every field of medicine though. There's always paperwork. But one thing I always try to do, um, and I feel like I'm getting better with the more I'm out is always making time for myself and my family. So that's why I have the picture of my dog down there. I always make sure that I go on a walk every day for my own mental health and for hers but also just taking, being able to take that time away from work to be able to spend with my friends or family. So that's very um, important to me. And that is something with podiatry uh, that they, they kind of say that you have a work-life balance, but that also depends on what kind of practice that you build. If you're strictly hospital and trauma and infection, um, that it kind of depends on what you're what you build. So I wanted to build a practice that I was able to achieve that. And I think that's everything in medicine and that they talk about this balance, but it, some days are balanced and some days balanced and other days, you know, aren't. So that's something just to consider in the medical field that in anything that you go into. So uh, in clinic, um, on average, I would say uh, the average podiatrist may see like 20 to 30 patients a day. Some people see 10 to 12. Others people can see up to like 50 to 60 a day. So it's very uh, variable on what kind of practice that you have. Um, what I love about having being in podiatry is that I do have this clinical aspect where I get to really know my patients. That was important to me. I wanted to... Um, get to know who I was treating, but then also have the ability to um, do conservative versus surgical intervention if necessary. So a uh, new patient comes in, I'm able to perform an HMP, uh, spend time with them, get to know them. And then the physical exam, let's just go through a basic physical exam of when I'm um, evaluating a patient, I'm looking at their vascular system, neurological, derm, and musculoskeletal system. So with vascular, uh, we work very close in hand with our vascular surgeons because <clears throat> um, the foot is the, first, the furthest thing from the heart. So if you don't have blood flow to your foot, you're never going to heal anything. So we're very close friends with our vascular colleagues, and that's why it's important. Sometimes we're the first ones to uh, evaluate the foot or be able to maybe start noticing beginning signs of vascular disease and be able to refer them to, uh, to get an intervention for the vascular disorder. So we're always looking at their pedal pulses, um, temperature, swelling, swelling in the foot. It's the furthest thing from the heart. So gravity takes a hold. So sometimes it's beginning signs of lymph, uh, lymphatic disorders or even congestive heart failure. So, I'm not just looking at this and be like, well, they're swelling in the foot and that's it. Uh, you're starting to look at other uh, systemic disorders as well. Neurologic. Uh, I'm often, once a patient, as soon as they're walking through the door, I'm already performing a neurological exam and going through the different cranial nerves as well. Um, a common patient population that we work with are diabetics, and there's something called uh, neuropathy, where patients are people who will start to lose sensation to their foot where they can't feel their feet, and then they're at risk of uh, developing wounds or injuries and infections. So being able to do a full neurological exam to determine their sensation levels, the reflexes, but also for other common neurological disorders that I treat, something called Charcot-Marie Char tooth, which is more of a hereditary motor uh, neurosensory disorder where muscles start to atrophy and it changes um, 
they start getting neuropathy, muscle atrophy, and uh, um, deformities of their foot. So that's why knowing your um, the neurological exam inside and out is also extremely important to be able to refer them to neurologists for other studies or other specialties as well, or if they do require a reconstructive procedure to give them a stable foot that they're able to ambulate. Dermatological, same thing, right? As soon as our vascular and our neuro starts going, that's going to also start changing our this the skin to our um, our whole body, but for the foot and ankle, also with diabetics, you're looking at a callus, same, like if you're lifting a lot of things and get calluses on your hand, you can commonly get calluses on your feet. If, uh, these can be painful, but they can also be signs of pressure or biomechanical imbalances. And also if you're diabetic and uncontrolled, that's how you can start developing a wound as well. And that if it's not addressed appropriately can lead to amputations, Common studies that we order, of course, x-rays, um, CT scan, MRI. I like ultrasounds as well. Uh, EMG or nerve conduction studies. That's looking at the, the um, motor and sensory functions of your nerves. And that's not just stopping at the foot and ankle. That also evaluates the lower back because right our nerves start at the brain then go down our spinal cord. So even if you have nerve pain in your feet. Sometimes it's not all the way, it's not from the foot. It can also be from the lower back. So it goes back with the neurological exam. And then vascular uh, studies um, will send out for uh, different various vascular studies as well, and potentially uh, refer for interventional procedures. And then I'm going to jump into two kind of common cases that a podiatric surgeon, uh, especially reconstructive, will see. So one of the most common pathologies we'll see is heel pain, right? There's over a million uh, times that people come into their doctors for heel pain. Um, and you may commonly hear, have heard of the term plantar fasciitis or pain to the bottom of your heel. It can be like worse in the morning, the first few steps out of bed or even after rest. And lots of times people will get this term plantar fasciitis for any type of heel pain, but that's not always the case. So there's a lot of metabolic disorders like rheumatoid arthritis, uh, writer's disease that can cause heel pain. There's all actually a very small nerve that travels in the bottom of your heel as well that become entrapped and also cause extreme pain. Um, pelvic floor disorders, lower back disorders. Um, so that's where it all comes kind of into play as well. So not just looking at the foot, looking at the whole body attached as well. Um, if it is plantar, true plantar fasciitis, the good news is that 75 to 90% of the time patients get better just with conservative clinical care within the first year. So going through that, I would do that physical exam. I would go through history and uh, history as well conservative treatment options that I'll employ or different oral medications, possibly steroid. Um, there's also beginning signs of even hypothyroidism causing uh, um, some heel pain dealing with the fascia. So appropriate medical management um, with other medications, looking at the underlying biomechanical um, disorders and being able to make modifications to shoe gear or orthotics working closely with physical therapy, injection therapy. Um, there's different um, with stem cells versus steroid therapy. And also podiatrists will perform additional treatments such as shockwave therapy, topical medications, and some are even um, trained in acupuncture and dry needling. So quickly, like biomechanically, I like will have a patient walk up and down my office because biomechanics do tell you a lot. You can be an overpronator which, or a supinator, and both of these put different types of stresses on the foot. Um, that's where I don't think everybody needs an orthotic, but this is when the foot needs to be more biomechanically addressed. That's where orthotic management, so being able to have um, a great deal of knowledge of biomechanics to be able to help people address um, this overpronation or supination. This can also help with knee and back pain as well. 
and then really understanding the anatomy as well. So like lots of times with heel pain, it's sometimes due more to a tight calf or what we call a gastrocnemia soleus equinus where their calf is really tight. So if that's not properly addressed, they're less likely to get better as well. And then if all patient, if a patient has failed conservative treatments, that's when um, potentially surgical intervention is necessary. This is a picture of um, through a scope, uh, very minimally incision, uh, releasing that plantar fasciotomy or releasing the calf muscle, uh, performing a nerve decompression or different, different surgical modalities to help with this in chronic situations. And then I really want to talk about another condition that we commonly treat that kind of encompasses, I feel like, all our skill set, everything from medical management to wound care to offloading uh, to surgical reconstruction. And this is a condition uh, called Charcot neuroarthropathy, which is really a devastating destructive disease that oftentimes can lead to amputation of the, the foot. Uh, this is with patients that have neuropathy. So they're unable to feel their foot. This can be diabetics. It can be alcoholic. It actually started, uh, was first reported in a long time ago with uh, uh, patients that had syphilis, longstanding syphilis that had neuropathy. Ultimately, it's actually fairly asymptomatic. So while their foot may slowly becoming destructive, um, they may not feel any pain or very disproportional pain. So it's extremely important to have them see a specialist right away at the beginning signs. So uh, sometimes, so you'll see these patients in the emergency department and they have like a red hot swollen foot without a wound. And they think it's like something called cellulitis or an infection of the skin, but it actually could be this, um, the beginning signs of Charcot foot. How does this start? Lots of times I see it with uncontrolled diabetics. That's most common, but it can be in any patient with neuropathy. And it could be triggered by the most minor trauma. When I say minor trauma, like someone just stepping weird off of a, a curb. Um, I kind of want to go through these stages because it kind of shows you everything that we go through. There, there, so there's four stages of Charcot foot. Beginning stage. This is where sometimes they'll go to their primary care and they just have a red hot swollen foot. Um, X-rays aren't taken. Uh, they're put on an antibiotic thinking that understandably that it's a, a cellulitis. Um, if they are able to get to a specialist right away and X-rays, well, we always look for these signs, of just a little hazy in the midfoot area. This is stage one. So this is probably a few weeks after stage zero. And you can see the destruction of that foot and how they've lost their arch. And um, this bone just becomes, I, I want to say, uh, it's just not normal bone. <laughs> um, almost like Play-Doh, right? It just starts melting and forming its own. Stage two, uh, it's when it gets out of this kind of red hot swollen stage and it starts to solidify in this area and uh, consolidation where the bone tries to heal on its own, but it, it never becomes back to normal. So they often then develop wounds, um, especially in uncontrolled diabetics, they're not able to uh, fight infection the same way. So they can start getting bone infections such as osteomyelitis. And you can just see how destructive this disorder is that within five months, this person's foot went from this to this, and this foot is at risk for amputation. Um, if they don't have proper vascular, maybe that amputation isn't even a below the knee amputation. It could be above the knee. So this, which also has any type of amputation, has additional stresses on the cardiovascular and has increased risk of mortality within five years. So this is a very serious condition. So we're not just dealing with um, medical management, it can be biomechanical wound care, dealing with infection. Um, uh, it's a, it's a very challenging disease to, to treat. 
The good news is if they are able to get to us within an appropriate time, 69% of those that um, are able to be offloaded at stage zero, they are able to heal without a deformity. So that that um, bowing or rock or bottom of the foot doesn't always occur. But by stage one, there's only 7% of patients that heal without that deformity. So then they're at risk for wounds and amputation. Conservatively, these aren't usually the best patients to go under surgical intervention. So we try to refrain from that from all costs and try to optimize the patient. Um, but you can perform total contact cast, uh, different offloading devices. On um, the top right-hand corner, that's called a crow walker, which is molded to the patient's foot and deformity, just trying to offload those pressure spots to help prevent further breakdown of wounds. Sometimes that's just not possible or they fail those conservative measures. Um, and that, that's where reconstructive limb salvage for those severe charco foot and ankles come in hand. Um, there's different modalities and different surgeries. Um, this is called this photo here of the x-ray with the, the nail. That's called the tibiotalocalcaneal fusion. Um, that's with internal fixation. A, this right-hand photo, that's called an external fixator, where instead of any like screws or plates inside of the foot. It's on the outside patients. It looks extremely painful. It's not. And patients are actually most times able to ambulate the on our uh, walk on this, um, depending on, uh, the patient and, uh, able to wear this frame and that actually started, um, through Elizarov principles from Russian surgeons. And then the goal is just to help prevent chronic ulcerations and provide a patient what we call a plantar grade foot, just a stable foot that they're able to walk on um, and reduce those pressure points and try to reduce the risk of limb amputation. So this case, this patient was an uncontrolled diabetic with neuropathy that uh, sustained an ankle fracture. And uh, this is ankle fracture repair was done at an outside institution. And I bet it was a adequate repair, but that trauma stimulated a Charcot neuropathy event. So then their ankle went into a Charcot event that we just went through the different stages. So this is what occurred after their ankle fracture. So you can see deformed, like this is their talus of their ankle. So that should be here. So they're essentially like walking on the side of their foot and developing wounds here. So using that, using both internal and external fixation, because that bone is not normal, it needs additional hardware um, to be able to be stabilized. And just showing you the power of what a podiatric surgeon and uh, the skill sets that we have being able to achieve that plantar grade foot for this patient. So they didn't undergo amputation. Um, with that, I just want to say thanks for having me. If you hopefully this uh, conversation has stimulated some interest in podiatric medicine and surgery. If you want to learn more, I do think the website www.stepintopediatry.com has a lot of different testimonials from students, uh, a lot more information on the schools and curriculum. It's been some time since I've been out, so did my best to try to remember um, and just uh, additional information. But I um, am always here as well. If you do want to reach out to me, I'm best re reached on my Instagram at Dr. Oxman. If this has stimulated any interest, I do recommend listening to the podcast, just so we have a lot of other uh, colleagues on it discussing their personal experiences in and outside the field of podiatry. So I think you get a little more um, insights as well. And with that, I just want to thank you so much for having me. Absolutely. For, for starters, we'd definitely like to thank you um, for getting this presentation together, these resources. Like I said, this is the first time that we had podiatry on our uh, shouting program. So for many students listening, I'm sure it's the first time they've heard about the specialty and this is such a great introduction. I learned a lot. I'm sure a lot of the students who are listening right now um, would say the same. And especially how you mentioned how it crosses over with rotations during training and even now practicing. A lot of the specialties, vascular, um, 
you mentioned a lot of cases of diabetes, you'll catch on to that being your specialty. It's really interesting to see the crossover. Um, not something I would have expected, yeah. but definitely great. Some, something great to learn. Yeah. Um, not a lot of people do ex- like expect that. And it's, uh, um, there is a lot of, a lot of crossover. So yeah, absolutely. And I wanted to kind of kick it off with, um, some questions. We have quite a few questions that rolled in. Hopefully we'll be getting to all of them, but for those who are listening, I'll go through them in the order that we received them. Feel free to type them in still as we go. Um, we'll try to get through all of them, but the first one we have is about the comparison and con- contrast of orthopedics to, um, podiatry. So this student is asking, why is there a pay difference uh, between orthopedics and, and podiatrists? What, what's the difference in practice in terms of what they're doing for their patients that would be the reason for that? That's a great question. And that's something that our organizations are constantly um, fighting for pay increase uh, with through podiatrists, because honestly, the same orthopedics that are doing foot and ankle surgeries, it's the same procedure that they just have a unit that is paid reimbursed more than podiatrists. So that is something that our, the leadership and our field is constantly striving for pay equal, like equality. Um, uh, I would say difference between orthopedics and podiatry, right? Orthopedics, they're going to go through their general orthopedic training where they're going to both, you know, shoulders, hips, and knees. And then after the residency, they do a one year, um, sometimes more than one year. I've met people that do more than one year additional training, just solely focused on the foot and ankle. Um, so they'll be, they'll do a fellowship specifically focused on that. While I liked that I knew I was going into the field I wanted to, I knew I was going to learn those surgical, like, be able to do both clinic and surgery. So I felt like it kind of just jumped me directly into what I wanted to do instead of possibly not matching into my preferred profession or not, you know, being able to get a fellowship. There's just a lot of variables, but that the pay also depends where you work as well. So people that are part of the department under a department of orthopedics, they may have the same RVU basis as orthopedics. So it's not just a general that podiatrists make less than orthos. And I just wanted to add quickly, you mentioned you went to Des Moines um, University for training. I actually went to school for high school, at least in Des Moines. So it's- Oh, you did? Yeah. Yeah. I loved, I loved Des Moines. (laughs) Had a great time. Yeah, I miss it too. I've been there for six years, but now I'm here in Texas. It's been around two years. I came around the pandemic. So um, yeah. it's always, a, it's a small world. I always, I always find that out through, through especially Hearts for Health. I, I hear a lot of coincidences, especially with our speakers um, for one reason or another overlap. But yeah. uh, the next question we have, I think you touched on this earlier, just a bit about call as a podiatrist. So just generally for a podiatrist, let's say that they're not necessarily in a subspecialty, um, like they haven't taken a fellowship. What does call look like normally for them? So then also, um, I'll, I'll say generally, like usually um, a hospital will have several on-staff podiatrists. So like my hospital has maybe like 15 to 20 staff podiatrists, meaning that they have privileges at the hospital. So you take a call. Um, I take a call once every like 15 weeks. So for my hospital, that's very doable. There's some people that have call every other week. So it also depends on if you're more focused on infections, trauma, um, and where you, what institution that you work for. Some patients, some podiatrists don't take any call through the hospital, but I would say on average, at least one week a month. And what does that, I would say on average, like one week a month. And then outside of call, or I guess not necessarily outside of call, but just combining call with your other shifts, what do your total hours look like in a week? How manageable have you found them to be? So since I started my own private practice, I set my own hours, but with owning your own own practice, you're kind of on 24 seven. So while I may only take call once a, you know, every couple months, I'm on call 24 seven for my patients. And then my clinic hours are usually nine to 
five or nine to six. Um, and then I'll have several days of clinic and then several days of surgery. So like probably a day of surgery a week. And then the others are clinical or what I call administrative days where I'm able to catch up on my paperwork. It looks like we do have um, a student who might have actually attended podiatric school outside of the U.S. And they're asking if someone happened to graduate um, outside of the U.S. in another country, how much of a possibility is it that they would have to be or that they would be able to practice um, in the U.S. after having completed school? Is it kind of like the medical school system where you have to have like a certain certification or be internationally accredited? That is a great question. I am not positive on that answer. I know I have worked with um, uh, colleagues from like even like Canada, but they went to school and then residency training. Uh, they had to undergo additional schooling and residency training. So I think um, APMA, uh, uh, American Podiatric Medical Association, or that even step into podiatry or send me a message and I'll, I'll ask my colleague that had to undergo that to get you more information or an answer on that. We appreciate that. They also wanted to add on, um, if you have any book recommendations for people who are currently in podiatric school. Oh, uh, so for those that are already in school, um, their first year they're asking specifically for first year students what would you recommend for them oh gosh that's so hard because you you already know about McGlamorys, you already know about mans which i think is a good resource um for me i really enjoy soft tissue deep like wounds and defects and ways like different ways to close them through like plastic procedures so i really like um the uh, intro into like plastics with a uh, doc dockery and mary crawford's textbook i also like the third edition of mclamory it's an older ed edition um but it has a lot of those kind of hidden uh questions that people will like to ask you at interviews like just like weird terminologies and different test studies that like that's where they'll people that have already been out in the field for a long time, like have these crazy kind of questions that they ask you. And they're like, how would you ever know that? Like look, read older generations of books because they wrote them and they're going to be in there. And then for orthoplastics and nerve, I really like uh, the clinics of podiatric and medicine. So you just put out two uh, intro to, into orthoplastics version one, uh, volume one and two. Um, that's by Dr. Edgardo Rodriguez and Dr. Suhail Masada. And there's several, a lot of different authors in that, um, that kind of touches on the things that I specialize in. So those are my, my go-tos. You mentioned that there is, um, a pay difference, right? Depending on location, um, outside of that, when you're just running a practice, how else does location, uh, make an impact? So like I'm in downtown Chicago. So my uh, pathology is going to be different than rural Iowa, where I have a colleague working that she's going to have a lot of maybe um, different pathology or deformities walk in the door that don't have um, ready, re like rural areas may not have the same access to medicine. So you are sometimes also helping management manage their diabetes or trying to help them with shoe like shoe gear or even braces. And I think you're even more hands-on in those rural areas than say in a urban area. Our next question is going back to specialties. Are there any specialties that are too niche for hospital employment? Hmm. Um, I think hospitals, they may have, I don't want to, I probably, probably because hospitals usually will have a patient population that they want you to serve, right? That you kind of don't have as much say on who and what you're kind of tailored to do, or that's in my experience. Um, so that's why while I'm affiliated with hospitals and able to work at the hospital, 
I that's why I went into private practice where I can kind of become more specialized and niche. That's very generalized. So I don't want to say all hospitals. And also, if you have a skill set that is very valuable and you're able to talk to that hospital and kind of leverage that, you could probably still do it. You mentioned earlier that you have a lot of overlap, uh, especially in your beginning years in podiatric school um, with DOs. Was that specifically because Des Moines University is an osteopathic school or is it something about osteopathic medicine that just connects more with podiatry? It was a while they, that they do connect. Right. And I did do like an OMM class as well. Um, But it was because it also was, it's an osteopathic school. Uh, So I think there's some, I think I want to say Shoal also has additional classes with MDs as well. So it kind of depends on the podiatric medical school. Our next question is, you mentioned in, I believe it was one of your third year rotations, you talked about jurisprudence, I believe, right? Yeah. In that rotation, what did you take away? I mean, it's not something that we typically hear of med students or PA students. So um, being a unique topic, what what did you take away and how have you applied it now to your own practice? I, my director at the time, like worked, he did a lot of outside work with jurisprudence. So he really, we highlighted on proper documentation, uh, learning um, what to do in those situations as well. If, um, I mean, it's not if it's when something happens in medicine, like you're most likely in your career going to have be sued. So it's not if it's when and learning those kind of procedures where what to the steps to take, but also learning more on um, also how to be an expert witness and like what avenues you can take to 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 do that as well. That's kind of what that rotation was. And that was that's uh that was definitely I think something special with my residency program. I know not everyone does that, but there are a few residency programs out there that highlight that. And speaking about programs, how do you prep yourself for the application cycle, especially with interviews? A lot of people are curious and it does carry over um, yeah. uh, between med and PA and, and the other um, healthcare fields. How did you prep for interviews in terms of questions to prepare for? Yes. So my during your third year, you apply for externships. So, um, and that's what those eight rotations that I was talking about that you do in your fourth year. So they look at your grades. They look at if you passed your boards throughout um, your training and then your extracurriculars as well. You get to apply for these externships and then um, uh, which you can learn more about the programs through like cpme.org, I believe, or Ca- uh, Casper Crips. That's like our organization that um, able to have our applications kind of cycle for both externships and um, residency interviews. So then you do your rotations and then towards the end of your fourth year, you apply for uh, residency interviews. And it doesn't just have to be at the places that you rotated at. You can apply to as many residency programs as you want. For me, and I think this, I want to say this year and next, these are usually done in person in Texas, where all the residency programs come for a weekend and all the fourth year students come and you're at a hotel and you are interviewing nonstop for residency programs. So they they used to be in person. They've been over Zoom due to the pandemic, but I think they are now going to be back into person. So your whole fourth year, you're spending time with these programs, right? You're learning their specialties. So you're really being able to study um, kind of get to know like what these programs each, like what they kind of specialize in and learn additional information. Um, That's kind of the biggest prep as well. And then I also worked with my like colleagues that I rotated with and we would interview each other and ask questions um, and go through different case presentations. But you do go through an interview process, you take boards. And then after the interview process, you have to wait three months to learn if you matched anywhere. So it's a long road. And then if um, you go through a matching 
situ- process just like all other residents. Yeah, yeah, definitely, definitely a nerve wracking year, but I'm sure it's a relief to to find out um, that hopefully, fingers crossed, we get matched. Um, yeah. One, actually, two more questions just to wrap the session up. The first being about those interviews, just to tack along and extrapolate off of that. Do you know what interview styles are most common these days, whether it's group interviews, is it one-on-one, um, scenario-based? Um, I think most, most that I, I think I did one group interview and that was, otherwise it's mostly like one-on-one and they usually will have an a- acad- academic So you're going through case presentations, like working up a case, like tell me like how I show you a picture of an infected foot. Tell me what you're going to do. And we go through a case workup. And then there's also social interviews. And sometimes the social interviews are more challenging and daunting than the academic, right? Like, you know, your knowledge, but but like socially, I think people don't prepare enough for the social interview. And that's, there's a, a lot of different um, resources on those websites as well that can help prepare you for for those. And one more question to wrap it up. Um, I'm sure going into the session, a lot of people might be asking this themselves, you know, flat feet, bunions, those are two things that people, you know, typically would think of as bread and butter for podiatry. So in those type of cases, what do you usually recommend? I mean, I, we hear about, you um, like different types of shoes that they can wear. I think there's actually shoes that uh, diabetes patients can specifically um, purchase and their insurance will pay for it um, because it actually makes that much of a difference um, from what I've heard. Uh, So what typically do you recommend? What guidance do you give? I look at each patient individually. There's not one shoe that fits everybody the same and there's not one person's bunion may be worse than con- like considered than a mild bunion, but the mild bunion may bother that person and limit their quality of life and function more than someone that has a large bunion. You're like, this should hurt you. And they're like, I'm fine. So, um, I actually, in, in school, I worked at uh, fleet feet to learn more about the shoe, different shoe gear. So like, there's not just one generalized, like new balance or a six, like there are different degrees of each shoe company, whether it's a neutral, uh, mild stability or stability shoe. So uh, that's where I think when you get into more generalized statements of this is what I do every time, then you're you're missing it. So, yeah. yes, those are definitely bread and butter podiatry things. And um, I do think shoe gear orthotics bracing uh, do play a large role and help a majority of people. And then in those times when they don't, that's when you turn to, to surgery. But, um, you asked a second part of that question. Oh, the diabetic shoe program also based off different insurances as well, and can be a challenging aspect as well with insurances. Yeah, I'm sure. Um, sometimes (laughs) it's just tough, you know, negotiating, but But yeah, we really do appreciate you again for for getting this presentation together, for answering these questions. Our students had quite a few questions, but we were able to get through them, thankfully. Um, I did want to have a few reminders just to wrap up this session for our shadowers who are listening in. So for those of you who want to earn credit for your attendance today, um, for listening in, we have a quiz. That quiz is now posted in the chat box. It's also going to be soon posted on our website. Just give it a few minutes um, and In that quiz, you'll find 10 questions. It's a Google form. If you're not familiar, um, six or more of those questions are required to pass. And once you do pass, you'll be sent a certificate to the email address um, that you list, the the address that you list on the quiz. So be sure it's one that you're comfortable with. We recommend a personal email, a Gmail, Yahoo account. Um, Those work. School emails tend to filter things out. And that quiz will be due this coming week, Sunday, December 25th. So just be sure to complete it before then at midnight. Um, after you do pass that quiz, like you, like I said, you'll receive a certificate. But let's say you don't happen to get the certificate in your inbox or spam folders. You're always feel free to email us. Again, our email is shadowing.h4, the number 4, h at gmail.com. And we will have another session later this week to wrap up our fall sessions. That will be on Thursday. We typically operate around a Monday, Thursday schedule. So it's going to be on this Thursday, December 22nd. Um, with Dr. Chavin. He is an internal medicine physician, and he has some fellowship training in integrative medicine. 
Um, so we'll, we'll hear from him about integrative medicine, medicine specifically. Um, but that's going to be all that will wrap up our um, semester, actually, and we'll have a quick break. We'll um, resume in January. I'm really glad we could get this session together just before the semester ends. Um, I really appreciate your time, Dr. Oxman. And for anyone who wants to follow her on social media, um, there's her handle on the, the screen in her, in her slides. So feel free to um, give her a follow. Um, if you have any questions, um, DM her. But like I said, we really do appreciate your time, Dr. Oxman. And, and for those um, who are listening in, let's drop in a few thank yous. Um, this took some time for her to get together and we really do appreciate her time. So, so yeah, that's gonna wrap it up. I really do appreciate y'all for joining in, the Shadowers, and we will see you on Thursday night, all right?